All right, Doc. Number six, what is your take on all the latest deaths amongst the elite bodybuilders lately, including Sean Roden and George Peterson? Anabolics to blame? Um, first of all, let me state for the record that neither of those two are my patients, so I'm not speaking out of turn, giving away any you know private information. Um, I, and I also didn't know either of those two directly, but uh, know of more than a few people that knew them quite well. And uh, okay, so specifically, and without getting into any, I don't want to start any rumors or whatever, but and so I won't. So so let's not get specific. But oftentimes. Um, you know, what gets to the headlines uh, is the sensationalistic part, and you don't hear about a lot of the underpinnings, for example, that perhaps the individual had an underlying condition, and that that individual had actually spoken up or and or been treated for that condition, but uh, did not put it in the media, okay? Um, and, and one of the problems with anabolic steroids, all anabolic steroids that we know about, is they tend to lower HDL cholesterol and raise LDL cholesterol. Now you go, so what, Rand? You've always said, who cares? Well, I say, who cares unless you have extant coronary artery disease? Then it's a problem. Remember, I've said this before, too. That, you know, uh, using a statin or Reggie's rice, or controlling your diet to lower cholesterol any way you can, supplements, uh, can, can lower LDL and can actually sl slow, stop, or even reverse coronary artery disease, okay? Um, and I always joke, uh, and I stole this from Dr. Pelican, you know, the, the, uh, the website that says, uh, it, you know, it doesn't do that is right next to the one that says, we haven't landed on the moon yet, and no Jews were killed by Nazis in World War II. We know it works. That's not the question here. The question is, it's really more of an antinomy over the years. If you don't have coronary artery disease, again, who cares? I, I've used the gasoline example right before where gasoline's good. Runs your car, runs your lawnmower, but you wouldn't, wouldn't want to leave the five gallons of gas in the can while the garage is ablaze because it could let, lead to a huge explosion, right? Um, LDL in the presence of extant coronary artery disease, which it's very possible and very likely from what I understand in some of these individuals, maybe even most of these individuals, um, can lead to a problem. If you've got coronary artery disease, you don't want to feed it with LDL cholesterol because it will feed it just like gasoline will feed a, a flame. So that's one of the problems. And of course, well, the anabolic steroid gets blamed. Well, again, that's like blaming the gasoline for the explosion in the garage, it wouldn't have been a problem if you didn't leave the acetylene torch going next to it, right? And so, okay, we can argue about that all day long, but anabolic steroids per se are not bad for you. And again, if someone who doesn't have coronary artery disease, I mean plaque in the arteries, then you can you don't have to worry about the LDL going up. We still do. It's standard of care in, in medicine to only use anabolic steroids if necessary for a brief period because we know it will change the lipid profile and so we back off after a short period and go, okay, let's make sure it comes back up and it does every time, right? And we prove, yes, yes, it wasn't a pathology, it was just use of anabolic steroids before we ever consider doing it again. Um, the other thing that they don't talk about, the media, is at least from what I've seen and heard being out here you know, involved with bodybuilders at the Mecca, uh, and not just bodybuilders, athletes in general, people that get to work out for a living. They eat, sleep, work out, and what's the expression? An idol minus devil's playground. Mm. Oftentimes there's recreational drug use involved. And, you know, guys and, and gals in the business know this is the truth. Um, oftentimes some of those drugs, for example, cocaine, can further coronary artery disease. We know there's a link there too. So um, is it anabolic steroids? I mean, that's like, you know, I don't want to get too political either, but... Um, if they don't talk about that, they're not going to talk about the other ones. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's been, unfortunately, cases, and I'm not going to name names, but cases where anabolic steroids were blamed for a, an athlete's death. And you look at the, the claims, you say, that's, that's just not possible. That cancer... That brain cancer, for example, is caused 
very infrequently and typically only in a patient with, uh, you know, HIV full-blown AIDS. So, you know, it might have been used as a scapegoat. Um, now, again, anabolic steroids can be misused. And if someone knows they have coronary artery disease or hasn't checked into it, particularly if they have a first-degree relative that has had it and they're getting up in years, I mean, that's the biggest risk factor for just about any disease we have is your age. We don't talk about that a lot because there's not much you can do to control your age. Mm -hmm. We can control diet and sleep and exercise. But, you know, certainly I would say if you're 50, just like, you know, and that's somewhat arbitrary, I get it. But you can look at the statistics and it's not as arbitrary as I'm making it out to be. But that's when people should get, you know, colonoscopies unless they have a family history that includes colon cancer, in which case maybe you do it earlier, 45. Now I think they're suggesting maybe even 40. Same thing, though, for a simple test. It's called a uh, carotid Doppler ultrasound. They, uh, they wave what's called a wand, literally called a wand, over your neck. It's really short, sweet. The guy's slow, the gal's slow. It'll take 15 minutes total. Why do we do that? There's a 95% correlation between what we see here and what's in the heart. And that's a good first pass. And I'm not, this isn't my idea. This is from Dr. Stefan Room, uh, you know, head of cardiothoracic imaging over at the Best in the West, UCLA. And he's been saying this and still says it for 25, 30 years. Um, no irradiation involved. But then you know, okay, if I don't see anything there, and of course the yield is lower the, the, the younger you are, but still, I mean, certainly if it pops up at age 30, you know, you have an issue. And in some of these cases we're talking about here, not necessarily here, but in general about bodybuilders, these things have popped up and, you know, it's very human sometimes to stick your head in the sand too and continue doing something that normally would be fine, getting, you know, your LDL levels up to over 200. I've seen it countless times with people in this country anyway on a ketogenic diet because they're eating so much saturated fat it doesn't mean it's bad for you necessarily and this goes into a whole other subject which i promise i'll stop here and i won't broach but it's not just about ldl cholesterol it's about the ldl particles themselves and something called a lp little a that's worth measuring much more so than just how much total ldl cholesterol cholesterol is attached to the ldl anyway so um Anyway, I, I don't think that it's fair to blame anabolics per se. Uh, it's like anything else when properly used, they're, they're, they're great. Um, so, yeah. yeah, food for thought, I guess. Yeah, I like it. Thanks, Doc. So last one's, uh, hey, Doc, what do you think about TRT for the elderly? I'm 81 and was considering it. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, at 81, you're probably way past due for TRT. <laughs> and I, I'm saying that jokingly just because... Uh, Look, I, I, I have a friend at the gym uh, who's 89 this year, and uh, man, he's tough as nails. He's a former stuntman, keeps himself in, in great condition, and um, I was going to say he keeps up with me, but I keep up with him, man. <laughs> I mean, he's strong, and uh, you know Chuck. I'm not going to say his last name, but I mean, 89, in great shape. I mean, may we all be in that great of shape when we're 89 years old. Um, I don't know if he's on TRT or not. My, my guess is he's not just knowing him, but I don't want to, who knows? But m my point is we all want to be that guy who's, you know, older and still going strong. And most 81 year olds, if you look around are not like Chuck at 89 and, you know, they're not even like, Chuck. I mean, yeah, whatever. They're not even close. So, uh, <laughs> you know, unless you're in the Guinness book of World records, certainly your testosterone levels are nowhere close to what you had at half that age, right? I don't want to get too far afield here without saying, you know, you still treat symptoms. You treat people, and if at 81 you feel like you're doing fine, is there a need to do testosterone? It, it all depends upon your situation. You know, you, you, yeah, but what's fine, what you're used to? That's the thing. Well, and again, yeah, it goes into a lot of things. Now, the one thing I will say there is there are correlations and that's a tricky word, but correlation between low testosterone and things like coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and osteoporosis. But a guy like Chuck's probably, you know, because of all his lifestyle choices, including the choice of his parents, maybe he's not in line for any of those things. But there is the possibility that, and, this, and I have to say, it usually has to do with the strength of character, someone who just doesn't whine. And Chuck's definitely not a whiner. Uh, not that it has anything to whine about, but a lot of people just, you know, oh, I don't feel as good today as I did yesterday or yesteryear. 
because, you know, I'm working so hard or I've got this stress or, you know, I stayed up too late night, stayed up too late the night before, whatever the reason is, they rationalize it. It's not until you go on TRT that you realize, whoa, I could have felt so much better. That's and what I, I mean. do now. That's know? what I mean, yeah. Um, so I, I guess you could argue there's a tipping point at which you go, yeah, by age 50, you should probably look into it for the medical reasons at which it might benefit you as well as the... The life reasons. I mean, there, there are very few potential drawbacks to the use of TRT, and they're controllable. Even if you do have, say, uh, conversion to, if you're, if you're more prone to converting to excess dihydrotestosterone, we have ways to manage that. Um, the other consideration, though, is certainly for someone who isn't aware of it or, um, you know, clearly could benefit from it. In other words, the weaker elderly, the more frail elderly, I argue, not just TRT, but I think one day, while I'm still alive and in the era of medicine that I'm practicing, I think you'll see more and more physicians turning to not just TRT, but certainly as a first go around with TRT, but maybe for some stubborn cases, go to anabolic steroids, certain anabolics that help put muscle on the frame of, because it's not just doing the right thing, at, you know, once you get to a certain age, I can attest to that now being 59, you know, I have to get that extra rest day in. Very different than when I was 48, okay? And there's just no getting around that because it's not just about testosterone and all the things we know from the gym science, if you will, aspect of it, the, the things that actually make sense. Um, but, you know, other factors keep you from holding muscle on as, as you get older. Um, I don't get into the details of it, but there's more than one factor involved, that's for sure. And anabolic steroids can make up for that. And one of the leading causes of death is hospitalization secondary to a fall in which the hip was broken. And the patient can't move, which is huge whether they're in the hospital or not. But oftentimes they're in the hospital where a lot of sick people are there and they get pneumonia and die. Not good. So to to, to prevent just even that, which again is a leading cause of death amongst the elderly, I think you're going to see doctors prescribing it more often because, again, it makes sense, right? It's necessary at this point. And I, I've always argued there's, there, you know, you're, Robin Peter to pay Paul has been more propaganda thing than anything else over the years. But here, what, do you, what would you be losing anyway, even if some of that propaganda were true, which is not? Uh, you're only protecting these individuals from one of the major causes of death. So I think you're going to see that uh, more and more. And again, I'm not just talking about guys here. I know we talk a lot about, you know, on the show, we talk a lot about uh, guys, but whenever we talk about testosterone, it includes females. Hint, hint, ladies, for more questions from the ladies, yes. please. <laughs> We're in need. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I like it. I like it. So you don't think, I mean, because so, uh, I would, I would have thought, you know, um, people get into that as they're getting into their late thirties, early forties, you know, fifties, and then maybe not care after a while. So stop, and then so maybe once you start TRT, and you're, you know, because you need it or because you you feel the need that you need it uh, for health reason, just never stop. And I think that's what people see steroids as something temporary. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, yeah, because they confuse anabolic steroids yes. with naturally produced steroids. Yes. Steroids coming from the word cholesterol, right? Right. And so they go, well, that's that's that scary stuff that, you know, people people end up on roid rages and, you know, goes back to that movie, which I've never seen, yeah. called uh, Reefer Madness. You know, you smoke dope, you're going to go to heroin and jump off a building one day. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of propaganda out there I that know. needs to be needs to be parsed out from yes. the, the real truth of it all. And, uh, yeah, I, I think you're going to see... Um, as I said, more and more people using it properly and understanding it, you know, first before they're going to be willing to try it. And that's hopefully what we're trying to do here. Right. What we're succeeding in doing here is, is getting the information out there so people will say, oh, well, that's different. Oh, that's something that, yeah, maybe I want to be on that for life. Just like, you know, a diabetic's going to want to be on something if, if that's the only choice for treating it because it'll be better for it, you know. Is it natural? No. no. No more than an antibiotic's natural. Or for that matter, going to the gym and throwing a bunch of iron around. That's not natural, <laughs> but it works. <laughs> yeah. And if you're addicted to that and it works well, it's a good trade, so to speak. I, ha I had a 77-year-old gentleman come into my office one day with his son in his 40s. Son was already on replacement therapy. And the gentleman, um, uh, they, they flew in from Florida. And uh, wow. 
what wow is you know the fact that this uh, father was was cajoled enough I guess by his son thank goodness to come and I heard the story it was sad you know he got up every day um, sat around the house uh, at 430 would get up and go around the block uh, for his exercise his outing for the day made sure he's home for the Uplifting 5.30 news every day, right? Oh, geez. Admitted that the only reason he was still here is he did not have the courage to kill himself. Oh. And, uh, you know, sat there very passively um, and, you know, said his very small piece. And I listened to his son explain all this stuff. We got him in on TRT therapy. This is a man who was totally uninterested in all this, was here really because his son cared enough to get him in here. And then uh, for the follow-up, Here's a guy who went from just a I mean, miserable life to, per his accounts, his son's, he's throwing tight spirals with the kids around the block now instead of, you know, just going once around. I mean, having a blast and now asking me, what else can I do? I think to your point where, you know, we're human and, and we can get into funks or not. And that's a lot of personality driven stuff so that hopefully sharing the information will have one more nail or arrow in the quiver that we can use that people are aware of and go, well, I don't necessarily have to feel this way because I'm getting older. Maybe it is testosterone deficiency and maybe I don't have to feel this way. Let me at least look into it see if that's the, the culprit here and, and certainly lead a much better life. I mean, and he's just, he's one of my favorite examples because, yeah, he, he, he turned into a type. Well, so what's going to happen, right? Well, um, you bring up a good point too and I say that to patients a lot. Um, that are considering it, but nervous again, because, well, it's not natural and things like that. Uh, and you know how I feel about that, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, I'm not giving you a shoulder replacement, in which case I'm tossing your, your natural shoulder and giving you a prosthesis that if you don't like it, you're stuck. Or you can try another prosthesis, <laughs> but we can't put the old one back. Just like a female who uses hormonal birth control, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time, and without getting too far afield, I'd say the only time we miss a, misuse it is there's still an argument, don't use it before you're 26. And that doesn't get publicized a lot because I think our fear of having unwanted uh, children is more uh, to, in the fore than, than uh, disrupting our hormonal development, the, the, the development of the HBA axis. Uh, but it, there's an argument you should wait till at least you're 26. But, um, geez, where was I going with this? I keep going off on a tangent here. Um, uh, where was I going with this? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about the, you know, you're just talking about, you know, the benefits of the, you know, the, 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 the father and how his attitude changed and, and all that stuff, basically, based on him trying it. What's the worst? I said, oh, what's the worst? Well, that could no, but the issue was, uh, you know, what, what is the risk here? There isn't one. Just like that female that goes on birth control. I it's keep going on tangent after tangent with my ADHD, sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, she goes off of birth control, hormonal disruption of her, using hormones to disrupt her own hormones so she doesn't get pregnant. And sometimes within a month or, you know, certainly typically by three months of cessation of the use of those disrupting hormones, hormonal birth control, she can get pregnant again. The same thing can happen with guys who at age 50 say, I'm not really sure, you know, it's something I need. Again, it's usually the person, honestly, that has... I don't want to say more character, but they, they tend, maybe they, I'll say that they tend to be more tough or tend to blow things off more. And they've lost conception. They've, they've again, in a very human way, said, yeah, I don't even think about how I used to feel when I were, was 20. Like, I'm not sure if it's going to work. And I say, hey, you're 50 years old. Worst thing that's going to happen is, just like that female I was describing, you'll try this. if It, it kicks in in six weeks, roughly. And a, a vial of testosterone is a 10-week supply, typically. If you don't know by that first vial, 10 weeks, okay, then you're not going to know and it's not working for you. For whatever reason you don't like it, you can stop and you go right back to where you started. Now, I don't say, I, I make sure I say, if you do it for 10 years, you're not going to go right back to where you started because you're 10 years old. But you'll go back to what you would have been 10 years hence had you not done any mm -hmm. uh, uh, testosterone replacement therapy. So, yeah, the risk is very, very low and you can say, well, let's see if this is the, the thing that helps. I had a uh, a doctor um, professor who said that for people with ADHD, he said, you know, t t think about the torture of that. H how do you test someone with ADHD? They have ADHD. You, you're going to get them in f on a table, right? 
and take a 400 question test, that's a nightmare for them. Really, the only test there is to see if they can do it, right? I mean, uh, no, but, but, but that's not the point of the story. The point was, he said, let me tell you the simplest thing. And this guy was a, 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 an MD and was an engineer, extremely bright engineer, and he became a psychopharmacologist. He said, the way I do it, he says, I just give him five milligrams of Ritalin, which is a treatment for ADHD. You'll know right away. And, and there's no harm in that. And, and I don't know what the, I don't know if he, yeah, well, I don't think there is any regulation against it or whatever. It's definitely not the norm in medicine. And I don't do that because I'm not a psychopharmacologist. But I thought it was brilliant. I saw him do it many, many times. And, and the patient will either go, well, no, I want to go, you know, clean out the garage and they'll do it for two days. And they wouldn't do that with five milligrams of Ritalin. But my point is, it's a, it's a form of uh, legal speed, if you will. Mm -hmm. Or they'll go, oh, this is perfect. Now I can focus. Right, and it's the same idea here, where there's no risk. Yeah, try it. You like it, great. If not, okay. Yeah, wrong. Exactly. Wrong guess. You know? Yeah, never uh, a guess, but you know what I mean. Yeah, good one. Thanks, Doc. Sure. Hi, right, Doc. Ready? This one says, Dave, I love the show, but only recently came across it online while researching TRT. You're the man. And thank <laughs> Dr. Rand for all the great info in the series. <laughs> I know you're. Guidelines for picking questions, and although this is similar to a previous episode, I think there's enough difference, and my circumstances are so similar to a lot of men out there that the answer will be very informative to a large number of people. I'm 54 years old and have been trying to get on TRT through my general practitioner for a couple years now, but he feels my T is high enough. Overall, I was feeling the typical symptoms, lower libido, and some erectile dysfunction, struggling to maintain at the gym and recovery. Problems with energy and sleeping, slightly depressed and memory problems in addition to weight gain around the belly, that working out six days a week, three cardio sessions, clean diet, uh, wouldn't touch and recovering from testicular cancer when I was 39. I'm a retired law enforcement officer, but still working at different jobs and, and numbers from my most recent labs he lists here, um, looks like his free T percentage is about mid-range. Free T is definitely on the lower end. Uh, total testosterone, 474. Uh, and he's giving me the typical reference. It looks like LabCorp, 264 to 916 uh, nanograms per deciliter. Combined with high cholesterol, his cholesterol total is 246, LDL is 157. Triglycerides were 209, that's a no-no. Uh, but from what I've read, I would think that I should have been a good candidate, but was just told to lose some weight. I'm 5'8", 205 pounds, and wear a, an 18-inch by 34-inch shirt. 46 to 48 jacket and 33 by 30 pants. I can already see Dr. Rand's eyes rolling. Being frustrated, I should have gone to a local TRT doctor. Yes. He's watching this show. Rolling. There we go. Um... I, uh, but instead talked to a friend at the gym and ordered online. <laughs> ordered online. How do you order online? It's a controlled substance, man. <laughs> uh, I started with 100 milligrams a week of testosterone sipionate before increasing to 200 milligrams, then 250 milligrams. Uh, but in order to balance the 250 milligrams, I was taking one milligram Remedex every other day, which made me feel nauseous, gave me joint pain, and gave me a roller coaster effect. So I backed the test back down to 200 and decreased the Arimidex to a quarter milligram every day, which seems to be working great. Since I started, to f since I started, I feel great, especially while I'm at 250 milligrams. Felt like Superman. With all the symptoms gone, but I'm concerned with the amount of Arimidex I have to take, plus the possibility of conversion to dihydrotestosterone. I have a healthy prostate with low PSA numbers. That means nothing. And most of my hair still which I'd like to try and keep as long as I can. <laughs> so my question is, because I felt so great at 250 milligrams, could I cut back to 100 to 150 milligrams of test and add 100 to 150 milligrams of nandrolone? I hope you're keeping track with me because there's a lot of questions here. There's certainly a lot of information here. Yeah. Theoretically, by adding the nandrolone, even cutting back on testosterone, I should have an equal or higher muscle building effect because of the higher anabolic effect Easier on my prostate and hair loss because it doesn't convert to DHT. True. It converts to dihydronandrolone, which is weaker than DHT. So 
So far, so good. Yes, theoretically, that sounds right on point. Joint healing, that's not correct, at least not directly. Indirectly, yes, if you can do the exercises to reposition the joint, if that will help you, but it doesn't heal joints. It helps with pain, but we have no evidence that actually heals the joint directly and physiologically it wouldn't make any sense anyway, but it could help you get through the pain to be able to do, for example, for shoulder pain, you know, typically people need to develop their terrace minor, so, you know, to pull it back into, to, to, to retraction. Um, so anyway, um, uh, let's see, to joint healing and since it converts to estradiol at a lower rate and less AI should be needed. All correct, except for the joint healing thing. You touched on it in an earlier episode and I also read it in a NCBI article uh, by Pan and, uh, oh, Jason Kovac, yeah. <laughs> Jason's another one from Dr. Lipschultz mm -hmm. uh, Fellows. That TRT improves risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, and in some patients lead to complete resolution. Yes, if they do the work they're supposed to do, eat right, train right, sleep right, uh, and cut back on inflammation. I don't remember the source, but I believe that I also read that because of these factors and the loss of body fat and increase in lean body mass, that it should also have a positive effect on cholesterol numbers. Possible. The article also stated that the increase in lean body mass and muscle with systematic use of nandrolone could improve body composition and augment testosterone's effect in preventing and reversing metabolic syndrome. Correct. Uh, and I also saw that the Arimidex is important because besides lowering estradiol, it also increases luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and natural testosterone. Well, that depends. If we're, if we're treating secondary hypogonadism, yes, that would make sense. I'm contacting you because obviously I should have... This is a really long question. I know. <laughs> Are you staying awake over there? <laughs> yeah. I'm contacting you because obviously I should have gone to a different doctor then, than I did, and I'm not an MD and I haven't been able to figure out everything I need to with exhaustive research. I know you can't give medical advice online. No, I can't and can only make broad suggestions. Thank you for understanding that. But maybe you can tell me if I'm on the right path and suggest what might be an effective ratio of testosterone to nandrolone and starting point for Remedex. Let me just stop there because I'm sure I've skipped over a couple of questions and we can go back, but I'm losing track now. Um, generally speaking with nandrolone, and there was a study, um, actually uh, Dr. Todd, who's on my team, who used to work with Dr. Lipschultz at Baylor, uh, is working on publishing a paper right now um, and I think there was a separate one done um, with Dr. Lipschultz, but the upshot is, first of all, you can use nandrolone in lower dose um, indefinitely, like a half, what, what, what we would consider a half dose. I mean, some bodybuilders would call it a, 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 like a decaf coffee, a why bother <laughs> dose, right? Uh, 100 milligrams a week of nandrolone, though, that's a, that's a lot if it's pharmaceutical grade and you're not, you know, I don't know where they're coming up with these other dosages, but... That's a hefty dose, but it helps with the pain, and it's used to treat pain. And in the studies, it has shown to help with uh, the healing of the joint for the indirect, indirect reasons, I can only assume, that we talked about. There's no cause and effect shown there, but because um, it would make sense to, but it's helped with the actual you know, resolution, not just the symptoms, but the problem itself. Um, but in general, the rule for nandrolone is you want to use an equal portion of testosterone to nandrolone because I think uh, he mentioned earlier about the conversion to dihydronandrolone instead of dihydrotestosterone. Well, a lot of people, not uh, enough people will have an issue with the lack of dihydrotestosterone and the presence of the much weaker dihydronandrolone going to the same receptor and being weaker and they have erectile uh, uh, dysfunction. dysfunction issues. And some people refer that, uh, I know it sounds vulgar, but whatever. Uh, the, the brand name used to be called Decadurablin. They call it Decadic. <laughs> it's associated with uh, Decadurablin or Nandrolone in this case, uh, the, the, the generic name, because of that, that conversion. So in order to avoid that, and everyone's different, right? But in general, the rule is keep it a one-to-one -one ratio. So there's still enough conversion to dihydrotestosterone that you'll, you won't have, suffer from erectile dysfunction. If that doesn't work, typically a shift to two to one testosterone to nandrolone will do the trick. So uh, that's something just to keep in mind 
when trying to come up with the right balance here. Um, he says here, uh, another consideration is I liked how I felt mentally and where my libido was at 250 milligrams of test. But if I cut back to 150 to, uh, 100 to 150 milligrams of testosterone, how much will that change? Physic is only one way to find out. Try. Again, everyone's different. Physically, the nandrolone will make up for the smaller amount of testosterone. But how about the other positive effects from the TRT? Again, everyone's different. Some people have a wonderful reaction, for example, to um, uh, oxandrolone. Some people not so much. Some people, right in the middle, it changes. They'll, they'll use oxandrolone for the first three to six weeks. The libido goes up. Everything's hunky-dory. And then the rest of the, 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 the time, um, you know, however many weeks are left in, in 12-week cycle, um, the wheels kind of fall off the wagon. So can't answer that one directly. It's something you kind of have to experiment with because everyone's different as to how they react to it. But um, also, I'm not trying to be a bodybuilder, just trying to get into the better shape, lower my cholesterol numbers, and be as healthy as I can. In terms of cholesterol, that one's a tough one to, to say you're necessarily going to affect it uh, because there's so many factors that can, can affect cholesterol directly. Certainly, putting more muscle mass on, not eating so many uh, starchy carbs, not forming that many triglycerides. When I look at lipids, that's the main thing I focus on is triglycerides because I can't say anything super nice about triglycerides. And typically, if you're in double digits instead of triple, which can still be a normal range as long as it's below 150, but uh, you're, you're probably okay if you're in double digits with the triglycerides. Um, but, and I don't want to go off into a diatribe about cholesterol. We've already talked about LDL cholesterol and how it gets uh, the name bad, which doesn't make any sense at all. It's like saying gasoline is bad. No, it's only bad around a, a flame in your mm -hmm. garage, you know, uh, when you don't want your garage to explode. So um, the uh, lowering the cholesterol can be affected by the things you eat, the way you exercise, the muscle mass you put on your frame, certainly. Uh, but it's not going to be necessarily directly related to this. Um, he says, I'm already headed in the right direction. And the 200 milligrams of testosterone per week will get me there. Just trying to see if the test and androlone will overall be a better combo because of the less uh, estradiol produced, less DHT produced, and less aromatase inhibitor used. Sorry for such a long question, but thank you very much for your time. And Dave, if you can put my question in the my question in, can you hit me back so I can send it to Dr. Rand or request an online consult? You guys are awesome and keep it up. Thanks. Okay. Where should I start? That's well you kinda of started already. I mean, yeah, no, but I mean I, I might have skipped over some stuff. So um, From what I'm getting the the gist yeah. of it was to basically he wanted to make sure that he could actually lower his test and include uh, nandrolone to it and that I think that's the crux of the question what well you think of it but I didn't hear too much about um, pain which makes sense to me to use what I refer to as the Lipschultz protocol where you know over an eight-week study they showed that using the the half uh, an ml of 200 milligrams per ml of nandrolone combined with the TRT therapy reduced pain considerably and remarkably well but if it's too adjust some of these numbers, for example, the cholesterol, lose some weight. I mean, I just said earlier that nandrolone is used for HIV and, and prater willi wasting syndrome patients. It's not the best one if you're trying to lose weight, considering, uh, you know, first of all, just testosterone done properly, managing the estrogen properly, which an excess of estrogen can, can help make you fat and hold water, might be enough. But if you were going to if you're bent on including an anabolic steroid, well, a better choice would be oxandrolone or even stenozolol, depending upon how old he is. Well, he's 54, so oxandrolone. Is he concerned about losing weight? Yeah, so he says okay. here, he's 5'8", 205. Uh, oh, and the other thing is, he says uh, he, he wears an 18-inch collar. Well, any ear, nose, and throat doctor worth a salt will just say, well, he's got sleep apnea, and more likely he does, because that's just that's a big neck. So that's not helping you at 54. Maybe you can get away with it if you're 25. You can have a neck that big and not 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 snore at night. But at 54, I would bet dollars to donut holes, he's got sleep apnea, and that's going to mess with you. I mean, I always mention uh, the book Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker, the the PhD we've got over at Berkeley now. He's the one of the ultimate guys with sleep. I always quote the the study that showed that 
five nights in a row of inadequate sleep, which I don't care if you're in the rack, the mandatory seven to nine, depending upon who you are, if it's not good quality sleep, five nights of that in a row, which if you sleep, I mean, if you snore, it's going to be every night, more than likely, um, will lower your insulin sensitivity by as much as 50%. So that could be what's thrown a wrench into the works in, ter in terms of his body composition management. It definitely lends, well, it, it supports the fact that his triglycerides were too high, right? At, uh, I think it was in the 200s. Anyway, it wasn't double digits, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, okay, just real quick, touching on some of these things. Uh, we've already beaten the PSA to, to death, right? It's not a cancer screening tool. Uh, so let's not even talk about the, the PSA. Uh, the conversion to dihydronandrolone. Dihydronandrolone is definitely a weaker substance than dihydrotestosterone. So it would be smart when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, effectuating less hair loss. It's definitely more anabolic in effect than testosterone. But again, probably not the best one for him. I mean, anyone who's 54 probably doesn't want to change his, his suit size at this point in life. So, you know, find something that'll, that'll net out to a smaller change. So you get more muscle, but also lose more fat. Uh, it's not gonna support joint healings uh, directly, nandrolone. Um, Should be easier on the, uh, the, well, DHT affects the, the prostate growth, obviously not necessarily cancer unless you have extant cancer. But remember this, don't use uh, finasteride or dutasteride with nandrolone for just that reason. You want to go ahead and let it convert to the dihydronandrolone, not prevent it converting from nandrolone to dihydronandrolone. Um, that would defeat his purpose certainly here. Um, Let's see if there's any, anything else I'm missing, Dave. No, I think that's good. All right. Well, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. It's a long question. And then uh, if you want some more questions, you can always just contact the office directly. <laughs> there you go. Well, you right. did give me an awful lot of details, so I, I can't make <laughs> too many excuses, pretty, right? Yeah. That was pretty good. Thanks. All right, thanks. All right, Doc. This one says, uh, hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. You, Dave? <laughs> I'm good. I have a really important question for me and hope you can help me. I did my blood work by my doctor, and she says my thyroids, th thyroid numbers are fine. But for me, I think it is on the lower side, and it would benefit for me to raise up for a better, a little for a better metabolism. But she doesn't want me to send the thyroid, sorry, this is, um, I beg your pardon. I, I'm doing my best to translate here, but this uh, is why you're reading. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I just uh, <laughs> not me. I'm pretty good. I can't. I don't know what the native language might be, but uh, she doesn't want me to send the. Oh, to, 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 I maybe thin send him to a thyroid specialist. I don't know, mm. but he has uh, he lists the normal ranges on his laboratory assays, and then he lists his assays. And yes, while they're in range. Um, his, and I can only assume this is free triiodothyronine or free T3. That's where the rubber meets the pavement. You're, that's what's real to you, okay, is, is the free T3. That's what does the work in the body. The rest of it is potentially getting it up as free T3 and then it'll do something for you. But uh, it's within range, but on the low end for sure. Um, so in my opinion, it is indeed between the range. So it is not bad, but my T3 level are at the is at the bottom of the range. And I think if I can double that to the max range, I can have a benefit, right? So I was thinking I can take directly T3, but then my TSH and my T4 would be totally shut down, or I take T4 and my T TSH would be still fine, and my T4 level will also raise up then so that my T levels also raise. Okay, this is practicing medicine without a license, so... Yeah, I mean, I'll read the rest of it, but <laughs> what can you say about my blood work and what is the best choice for T4, T3, or nothing at all? Thanks a lot. So, and I'm, I'm just joking. I don't have a name here, but um, the, as I always say, you don't treat numbers, you treat people. And I can't give medical advice this way, but if I saw lab work like this, it would give me some additional fuel for a diagnosis of low thyroid, A, because it's on the low side to begin with. This is just a snapshot, but 
it would give me some some fuel if the patient had symptoms, which is the most important part. Does the patient have a decreased energy? And that, and that can be from so many different reasons and oftentimes is, is complicated by the fact that testosterone mimics a lot of the same, or a lack of testosterone mimics a lot of the same symptoms as low thyroid. But, uh, you know, the typicals are, uh, you know, cold when everyone else is hot, dry hair and skin, <coughs> and an actual lower body temperature than others. I refer to thyroid as your idle speed, okay? And testosterone is more uh, um, a part of your, uh, what I call your, your horsepower. But having low testosterone can lead to dry hair and skin, uh, being cold, uh, because what keeps us warm? You know, shivering muscles help keep us uh, warm, and the muscles themselves, without even shivering, uh, does a good enough job before you get really cold. But you get my point. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of crossover there with symptomology. And... Um, you know, I wouldn't make a judgment based upon just one lab result either, because this is just a snapshot shot. And for those who are math oriented, I mean, one group of data points, I, I realize it's the way we do it oftentimes in medicine. And in some ways it works great as long as you focus on the patient and not just the numbers, because as ha has happened here, the patient may indeed be hypothyroid, at least clinically speaking, have all the symptoms, but you look at them, oh, you're in range, fine, you know, Go away. There's nothing wrong with you. This is my favorite. Then how come I came to the office, Doc, right? I mean, you can't figure out what's wrong with me, but there is something wrong with me or there's something wrong I'm complaining about, but we just don't know what the source is. But in this case, I think, you know, with a free T3, which by the way, I mentioned idle speed. Uh, it's one of the most, it, hormones that fluctuates the most. Okay, so someone with very healthy thyroid might come in with, uh, you know, let's call the range uh, let's say uh, uh, 2.0 to, to, um, to 4.2. Someone might come in with 2.1 today, and then the same person come in tomorrow and be at 3.8. It fluctuates, and then there's actually a term called sick thyroid for, for um, that's the medical term for a thyroid that's, uh, that's sluggish. Because when you do get sick, your, your idle speed slows down a bit, which makes sense in terms of just you know, evolution, you know, save, save energy while you can because uh, you can't go out and forage or, or hunt while, while you got this going on. But day to day, being tired, you know, can, can lower your thyroid or not. I mean, so, so anyway, the point being is that you can't make a judgment based upon one laboratory assay. The other thing to know is, since I already mentioned it, is if you throw testosterone in the works there, and one of the reasons why you should throw it in is because, like I said, they, they can, uh, they can um, very easily resemble one another, their, their, their lack thereof is if you add testosterone to someone who's got low testosterone, give them testosterone replacement therapy, the body will make more thyroid. If you're, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, you know, if you're euthyroid or normal thyroid, your body just says, that's fine, we don't need it, and keeps it bound up. But if you're someone who has low thyroid, then the body says, thank you very much, and you've killed two birds with one stone. So yeah. uh, I think in this case, it's probably worth looking at the testosterone levels, uh, we didn't get an age here, but um, if that's not appropriate, so be it. But I think at any, age, at any age, it's worth looking into. Wouldn't make a judgment based on one number, need to know more about the symptoms. Focus on the free T3. And um, as always, if you're not getting the answer, you feel is the right answer. And I always say my patients 80% of the time seem to be right. They know what's going on. They may not be able to explain it in medical terms, but they'll give me the answer 80% of the time if I ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. If you think there's something wrong with your thyroid, it's worth checking into is my point. And certainly there's something going wrong. I don't think he's just chasing numbers, right? I mean, right. he didn't mention uh, the symptoms, but um, uh, if you think there's something off, check into it. So another opinion. Good advice. Thanks.